about those sole practitioners? I think uh, there was a statistic that said 76% of architecture firms have 10 employees or less. Yeah. And uh, a lot of them then will actually be sole practitioners. And uh, in some ways, you start off as a sole practitioner. So with yeah. the Thinking Hand Studio, yeah. I'd love to kind of get your insight on how you go from a sole practitioner and what would be the process, I guess, of scaling that up. Because the amount of insight you've probably got over the last you know, years, few years with uh, the business of architecture, I mean, you know, kind of share some of that wisdom with us. It's... Yeah, the process of, well, it's interesting because there's so many different ways of scaling up your business. And the first thing is, what's the vision for the business? Why, why are you doing it? Why do you want to scale it up? What kind of work do you want to do? What kind of lifestyle do you want to lead? What's most important to you? Some people are setting up architectural practices because they've got a burning hunger to create massive buildings. Mm. Some people are doing it for a lifestyle choice. They want to have more freedom. Um, some people want to make a load of money. Um, what's, the, what's the sort of the driver there? And there are, you know, it, it, it's interesting speaking to someone like Joe Cow, an architect who's gone from two man band in working in a bedroom to like a 50 person practice on the King's Road in a, in a relatively short period of time. And the way that she's done, gone about doing that is, again, she's very commercially intelligent. She understands the pain points of her clients. She, she hasn't created a, uh, um, most architects, you know, pitch for work and they end up competing against each other to do something. And it's difficult to differentiate yourself in such a competitive industry where everyone is bloody excellent. Like there are so many in London, there is no shortage of like incredible architects. Yeah. everywhere like so many there's brilliant so you, you know and it's difficult for a client to be able to differentiate between them and clients don't necessarily choose you on the merits of your design they choose you for different reasons and you might not always know what those reasons are but part of your ability to be a good salesperson and marketeer is to delve deep into what those emotional drivers are kind of going back into what we were talking about at the very beginning of this of this conversation and joe's as an example was was very good at doing that she understood that her client's pain points as a developer was pre-planning. They weren't very liquid in terms of capital. It was difficult for them to get investment. This is a kind of typical problem that developers experience. You know, one, planning is where the first uplift in value comes from the land because it's a, something that's certain, it's legal. Yeah. It's like, you know, you definitely can get X amount of units on this site now. Um, and once that's in place and got the tick boxes, investors are more likely it lowers the risk for investors or finance so money can come in etc cetera, etc cetera. so before that period of when planning has been decided um the developer might be a bit tight on cash to to do the projects and one of the biggest pains of that is architectural fees mm -hmm. so she was able to structure her fee arrangements to be able to assist with that with the client so and but most importantly, to be rewarded for the risk that she was taking by, you know, either postponing her uh, architectural consulting fees post planning. So she had to have a very good appraisal process in the right. first place to be able to know that, you know, this is it's a risk, but we're pretty certain that we can do this. Yeah. Um, and then but that puts you in a good position to negotiate and say, look, well, we'll give you my fees post planning. And if we do that, then we want you know, you can negotiate for an equity stake in the final development. You can negotiate higher percentage of fees. All, all sorts of stuff starts to align. The difficult part is now you've got a year where you've got to pay people to essentially work for free. Yeah. You know, you, how are you going to do that? So again, you get creative. This is the this is the thing about business is it's hugely, hugely creative and you've got to figure, it's problem solving, you've got to figure something out. She ended up, you know, making sure she had enough work from uh, from private residential projects to be able to cash flow the work that was being done on these developments. She was able to remortgage a house to be able to, you know, she, she, she took that personal risk to be able to ensure that that happens. But that's become, you know, a, a kind of business model in itself, which accelerated the growth. It meant that because she was offering something like that to the client, they're not going to you're solving their pain immediately. Yeah. They don't care like 
about other stuff. You've got the ticket here. But then does she adapt that for different clients or is it now she's got that template that she knows works? Yeah, she. I think she does it. She does that for different clients. She also has a thing called Joe, uh, Joe Cohen Capital. So some of her wealthier clients who have done private residential work, they are also the kinds of people that might want to invest in a certain type of development. So she's, you know, can pull together again, it's a bit, it's the soft skills of networking, negotiating, being creative, entrepreneurially, creating a new deal, um, you know, able to, you know, create a basically in you know, a pot of money, essentially from wealthy residential clients that then she can go to a developer and say, look, Mr. Developer, I can structure you a deal that um, that where our architectural fees work with how your investment work flow works. So we can get paid either post planning or we we'll take a reduced rate up until planning decision is made. And um, we've actually got a capital fund of, of investors who want to invest in your types of projects. Who do you think developers going to choose? <laughs> They're going to go to her every single time. And, you know, she aligned herself with developers who were young as well. So they were, so they were kind of uh, building their businesses at the same time. Wow. So it, this, is, this is the understanding people and building rapport and yeah. getting into entrepreneurial communication with other people. Now, once you've done that, once you've solved that developer's problem, your design agenda, your sustainability agendas, your... Yeah. your ability to make sure that this place is really important for human beings to live in you've got a lot more leverage to make those conversations a priority yeah and i can see and that's amazing because i can now see what you said what you mean by marketing as an art form because joe cowan has kind of done that you know you designed the right kind of system that works for different people and i think that's Another thing to kind of, a lot of people will think, okay, to start an architecture practice, I've got my, I've got my experience working in a big firm, a small firm, you know, I've got all that design experience, but what about the business experience? What about where do you get your kind of intellectual kind of, uh, you know, basis for how, how to, you know, work a business art form? And I think that's, it kind of puts the emphasis on how important that is. Yeah. Because just by her kind of creating these bespoke systems, she's able to really cater towards the needs of her clients because the clients don't just want design. They want something that works for them financially. Yes. That works. Exactly. Most clients don't care the about your design. Process, right? The whole culture of portfolios and CVs and like, you know, we spend so many thousands of pounds making incredible images. Like your client doesn't care. Yeah. Your client doesn't care. And how saturated is the market of it's just amazing renders? In fact, when you show a client, okay, when I'm running my practice, I quickly learned early on, clients never ask for a CV. They don't care where I've gone to university. They don't care about what grades I got. Um, nor do they even care about a portfolio of work half the time. Wow. They don't care. They want, they've got a project with, the, with their needs that they want solving their home. It's important to them. And even showing a client a portfolio of your work can sometimes, again, it, it, it can be like, in the, in, you've got to get the mindset of, of a client, I could just talk domestic, residential. Um, you're showing them projects of other people's houses. Mm. They want their house. Yeah, um, they want the attention it's needed. They don't want someone else's house, right? Yeah. And it's just a different mindset. Some clients, you know, if you present it in a certain way, you can kind of give them like a selection and say, no, we could do a bit of this for you. There's all this again. It's all in the communication, but it's just as a different starting point. The client is they've got a problem. They want something done to their home. They want to build their home. They don't want somebody else's home. I was chatting to a marketeer recently, and she was saying how um, you know, as a as a when you as a photographer, for example, if you're showing a client portraits of other people. They 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 care about how they're going to look in this in this portrait, basically. That's the that's the mindset. That's where you want to meet them at anyway. Um, and when you're able to address the problems and understand the problems of of that, then you can build trust. You can build rapport. Um, you can build a good relationship for design. It means that your design agendas can be realised more fruitfully. 
and you can do it in a sort of in a staged in a stage process but it's you know this is the thing about my criticism of university for example is one that we have the culture of portfolio and crit yeah and I, I think it's quite good that you have to get up in front of a group of people and then they um you know there's a bit of fierce dialogue that can happen that's that can be very again it depends it could be empowering or you can end up being destroyed by it i've had many a crit where i'd run off and like hide in the toilets afterwards and be like oh my god my life what am i doing um and equally have you know gotten a lot from that kind of that kind of um dialogue mm -hmm. but the idea of you know portfolio and you spend so much money on this portfolio and you're trying to seduce through the image misses out a big key component of like when you're dealing with another person who's going to pay you money to make them a building you need to understand what it is they're really wanting to invest in you want to understand what's what's triggering the mammalian and the reptilian part of their of their brains what's the what's the emotion behind it that's an interesting point it's almost as if the crits are more catered towards selling to other architects exactly so the culture of architectural industry at the moment is that the way that we market ourselves typically the default mode of market, marketing for an architect practice is to sell to your competitor mm -hmm. we are making our portfolios our websites in order to be digested by other architects yes. and <laughs> and there is a culture where we care more about what other architects think about our work than what our clients might think yeah. and it is and i don't want to i don't want to negate that because it is important to be acknowledged by your peer group and with other architects and there is nuances in in the buildings and the art form that we're that we're doing that we do want to, that might get missed and other architects will appreciate but also it's a kind of culture that university breeds that is unrealistic in the world of running a practice in lots of lots of senses the, the the other point about what happens at university is this culture of not dealing with finance as a constraint and if we do get involved with business at university it's either a sideline project or a course um, we never get to enjoy that creative fervor that we bring to architectural projects to bring to the business aspect of it so business is kind of put in a little box over here um you do it you know you'll figure it out when you're actually in practice um actually it's not really our business to talk about money and as such and things like that and what it means is that the latent power that of of architects and architecture the training that we get as being these people who are able to deal with complex things that don't ultimately resolve neatly that we're able to have this kind of broad oversight we're able to synthesize ideas we're able to make links all over the place of different things not applying that to business and our own careers and designing our businesses and designing our careers is like a loss and you know i know that uh you know you get lots of architects who go off and do other things and you know you get people who go into computer game design or but that's also a very kind of literal translation of a set of skills yeah. and then doing something else and then creating a boutique kind of company that's delivering on it. Yeah. There's more, you know, there's more that an architecture student can deliver. You know, architecture is a three year degree. It's, yeah. it's like you're right at the beginning of life. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like three years. You can go off and do anything. You can go and work in finance. You can go and work in um i think they don't they have uh, they have like a uh, continuation courses for people who have architecture bachelors and they can go into law yeah, yeah. exactly because they, they they understand that the kind of tool set you have as an architecture student is so broad and so applicable to so many different professions and fields uh that it can work in many different ways and i think in, yeah, this brings us kind of very nicely onto the idea of well there's almost a difference between i think we were talking about how you can kind of generate start your practice and maybe grow it mm -hmm. now what we're seeing and, and you, know, you we both have interviewed adam nathaniel Furman, yeah. who's kind of really you know getting uh, you know he, he he's he's gaining a lot more prominence with his work mm -hmm. uh, currently um 
and even you know Ed, Edward Crooks, who's who's a sort of friend of Adam, who he's also just done an amazing sort of public art piece, uh, I believe in Barking. Uh, I might be wrong, but some some area of of East London, I believe. Yeah. Um, where these architectural practitioners are in 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 a way to kind of set their brand, create their brand. Where I imagine they want to eventually start quite you know maybe a firm or a practice, a design practice, multidisciplinary design is becoming a really good avenue to grow a practice. Because yes, as you say, the standard traditional way is to go and do your mum's or your aunt's extension and suddenly you start to, you know, build the portfolio of built work. Mm. And that's a great way to, you know, maybe get onto the ladder of uh, practice. But now we're seeing people who are doing multidisciplinary design with an architectural background it might be like edward did the you know a public art piece on the floor and walls or you know adam doing installation pieces and i'm sure there's many more examples uh, that, that are out there uh, and they're now establishing their own market mm -hmm. they're now establishing their own you know yeah Bob Bass, Bob Bass and Farr is a good yeah. example of that kind of right. go, going into a very sort of niche area of design or multidisciplinary yeah. as well right and creating your own your own world, um, your own world. There's, there's also like, there's, there's so much infinite potential of the type of way you want to practice. Like it's kind of, you know, we've barely begun to scrape the surface of it. I was chatting to um, Adam from Free State recently. He does a lot of like experiential architecture, you know, for, for corporate branding and corporate storytelling. And, right. and that's just fascinating stuff, working with these large corporate clients about how you can tell the story of your, brand spatially where that might be applied to and, and and it goes even beyond i mean for me i even think about like as an architect you can even let go of design now this is getting a bit sort of you, you know go, but you can start i mean what i do i still is design like i work one-on-one -on -one consulting with with architects practices yeah. but i consider that design because i'm helping them i'm working with them to design their businesses and the design tools are not necessarily sketching and drawing, they're conversational tools. And did you learn them as an architectural student, would you, would you argue? Yes, yes. I think there is some, there's definitely a template of the way that I, I'm like in my DNA still an architect. Yeah. It's still like the way I look at the world. And that is the, the process of being able to visualize an end product and then kind of conceptualize it and create kind of these whether it, it might not be a, a you know a drawing format, but whatever format you start to build a concept, that's something you really learn in architecture. Yes, an iteration, yeah. doing things again and again and again and again, and that kind of that brutal process and realizing actually this is the way to, you know, to make things yeah. evolve and to be. And also, you know, where's architects and architecture school? This is why it is such a wonderful environment because you do get the chance to speculate and become visionary about things and you start to ask questions about humanity and society and how can we all get along and you're considering so many different seemingly unrelated things and you're finding a way to connect them. Now this is like, the, that is so golden for, for entrepreneurship and for business. We look at people like Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, these kinds of titans of different industries were architecting in their own way of bringing together, you know, calligraphy and computers. And, and that's you know, why architect itself, the definition, right? Is pinched by all sorts of other industries and used. And, and, and again, there's, there's an opportunity there for us as architects to, to venture into different disciplines and like uh, not be frightened about coming off the structured path of being an architect not even having to rely on the the physical skills that we learn as an architect like yeah. computer programming or 3d design and actually the thinking skills that make us architects like where could that take us to in a different discipline where could that go in a different in a different industry and you know hans holline i often even i do lectures and stuff I often use the hans holline quote where he's talking about and this is from 1966 and he's yeah. talking about how architects will need to move into different disciplines away from purely built modes of production. And, and, and again, for me... Sorry, uh, who said this? Hans Holleim. When? 66. Okay, because Chris Hildry said that 2020. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah. But, it, but it's, it's a universal acknowledgement, right? Like we have the tool set to do so much. So it's almost, and it's not just 
you know, obviously I'm talking about Chris Audrey because he was the last person on, on, the, on the podcast, but I believe it was also uh, famous phenomenologists uh, uh, who, um, who were saying that the potential that you have as an architect to do, you know, other art forms is so broad that it's almost absurd and almost, uh, you know, detrimental. And this is, I think, where we're going to come to. And it's actually my contention, you might agree, of why I believe we're kind of in a crisis, is that we have this apprehension to diversify what we actually offer as a designer, as a, you know, I think I, I would call it a designer. I don't know what you would call it, maybe a creative or whatever. But the word architect is almost, I almost don't want to use it at times because people, you know, if I tell people, you know, you know, that, that I'm trained to be an architect, they instantly associate with buildings. Yet my experience in, you know, five, six years of doing this profession and and the, and, the, and, the, and it's academic, and, and, uh, uh, academia is I've had very little experience building I've yeah. had much more experience and time and hours and you know the 10,000 hour rule of you becoming a specialist in something in a much more broader frame of you know maybe sketching or coming up with a visual uh, vision and it's essentially creating a, a, a vision that reconciles Philo philosophical, artistic aspect of things with a very real and logistical and realistic thing. And I think that's what makes architecture architecture, right? You've got these two worlds. Yeah. And now you can see why this thing is called two worlds design. It's the material world yeah. trying to reconcile with the internal world. Yeah. And I think that's what you're trying to say, right? Yeah, no, exactly. The profession is wonderfully broad. That's what's interesting about it. And like, it's up to us to be able to redefine where it goes, how, where, how you want to practice. It's like, it's an individual thing, how you want to interpret the word architect. Um, there's like infinite scope for using it. I mean, I think I was talking to Rob Hyde, who's up at uh, Manchester Uni and they, they do a brilliant sort of professional practice uh, education where they have all sorts of people from industry and different disciplines coming in and talking about all the different varied various ways of running a business and you know they actually get their students to design this the only university that i've come across that's really like progressive in the way that they're approaching um business in the world of architecture um mm -hmm. and he actually has like they have like a sort of uh, business design atelier if you like so the students actually go away and they design what their business model might be, what kind of practice they might end up doing, what sort of work they might do. So, you know, they had students who were um, speculating about, you know, subscription-based model for architectural fees, doing different types of projects. You know, they've had students um, linked up with going and working for companies like Cisco, um, you know, and, and making the, the real acknowledgement that as, you know, if you want to have an impact on the built environment, you might end up being better off working for a large data company than you would be an architect so that that's the real that's the real sort of stuff of it then and there's the the traditional practice of architecture you know the organization of physical space that's one thing of yeah. architects that's crazy we're in this weird moment i think where we're, we're starting to move away from that definition of architecture it's kind of surreal to think that you know you just said it built form is one avenue of architecture yeah. or some people might find that quite you know they might completely disagree you know be throwing up right now the, that statement that how dare you say architecture is not about built form but you know the people i've spoken to you know like you chris and adam and you know and from what we're seeing now and 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 now we're kind of going through another uh, environmental kind of awareness because of all the sort of uh, you know, the XR things happening and, you know, the UN stating there's an environmental crisis and whatnot. There's now a whole new opportunity for architects to diversify further. I think the environmental thing provides an opportunity for that. But I wanted to ask you, now that we're kind of, and, and I kind of said it, that we're seeing certain artists and architects diversifying in this way, and obviously technology is being leveraged in an incredibly, you know, innovative way as well. Yeah. And you talked about the students doing maybe like a new model for subscription. Some of the hardest things to do in business is, is getting clients. 
and, and, and being able to market yourself. What opportunities do you think there are now and they could be in the future to really innovate in that area? Uh, and Wait, in, ter- in terms of winning new work? Yeah, like, it, you know, for example, with the practice I worked at, and I haven't seen many new innovative, you know, templates for getting clients apart from, you know, word of mouth and networking usually ends up being the best way, I feel. And, you know, you must have a lot of experience speaking to people and knowing what, what works. But what works in the future? What do you think could really, really be the way going forward? Like a subscription thing? Well, I, I, again, marketing is kind of trend based as well. So, you know, like there are principles of marketing that work and will work regardless of platform or medium. And then there are sort of cultural trends and things like, you know, what works now with a lot of things that we teach in the business of architecture are like sometimes quite old school methods like a you know like a newsletter or or you know an old uh, a phone call or you know real physical connection sending somebody a, a, a parcel and you know establishing that relationship and rapport mm-hmm. digital media there is so many different ways to get creative with it like tools like linkedin you can go and find out so much personal detail about somebody and start conversations with people you know podcasting is like one way of constantly marketing your skill sets your business you know i built a a business from a podcast basically it's taken a number of different attempts to see what works in terms of how to monetize it and it's not always straightforward and what works for this person doesn't necessarily work for you and you've got to be able to go through that iterative process see what's working for you. And there's also things like, there's a lot of self-awareness in all of this, like knowing yourself, knowing what you're good at, what your strengths are, playing to those strengths, playing to the things that you're best at communicating, being aware of the things that you're not doing, like, you know, reaching out to people. You know, a lot of architects just rely heavily on uh, word of mouth referrals. In fact, most architects rely on that. And that can be a very um, up and down process there's often no systems in place for for doing that and simple systems can be used you know like again like just sending out uh, a newsletter or actually asking your clients in the upfront sales conversation you know uh you know if we do a good piece of work for you i'd love it if you were able to give us uh, two yeah. two referrals like just 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 asking people so there's there's that really old school technology yeah and there's this there's social media there is being able to use social media in an inventive and creative way people want to know about your story they want to know about you you can i don't know if you ever watched gary vaynerchuk or these kinds of digital marketers that kind of uh, you know talk a lot about um producing content and your business becoming having a media arm to it essentially yeah the the business business of architecture is a lot like that we've got the podcast we've got a media arm you know there's constant updates and snippets of of bits of valuable content that is designed for the listening of a particular niche audience of architects about things that they're dealing with and that are important to them so being a producer of content and again it's a conversation you know marketing isn't portfolio presentation here's my work look at me it's a conversation you want to have a conversation with people you want to be able to use these platforms get good at them be practitioners in them you know like we were talking at the beginning about anchor and archi travels and all of that was learning to craft a little story and learning to like get comfortable in front of the camera and to express and you know start a narrative and you know and and people are enrolled in that people are enrolled in other people and we want to find out about other people i'd love to see more architectural practices not copying each other for their marketing um and and sort of like you know just relying heavily on the photographs but actually starting to tell the stories behind the practices but 
tell them in a way which is relevant to the audience and the target clients that they want to be discussing. You know, it's almost like applying that creativity they have to their own marketing and business yes, yeah. agendas as well. Now, 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 some architects do this naturally. Yeah. And who's a good, good example, do you think? Of sort of natural marketing. Um, I mean, I, I, it may be that some of the more prominent things you see, I mean, John Pawson, you know, he he seldom posts anything but you know some really atmospheric or you know minimal photograph uh it's in some ways that's his way of marketing what he does yeah totally yeah. well you know giving lectures is a form of marketing um education is a form of marketing um there are i mean i was really inspired by bride and wood recently oh my god i, I just <laughs> I, I i thought they are genuinely disrupting the industry. That was one of your recent episodes? It hasn't been released yet. And I went and chatted with Jamie there. Um, and so Bride and Wood are multidisciplinary practice. They've got engineers, structural engineers, they've got data software analysts in their coders. They've got, you know, it's probably a 200 person practice now, but they started 20 odd years ago real heavy links into design for manufacture, um, a real kind of deep understanding of the entire architectural process. And they're using technology in a very innovative way. So it's not, you know, architects are good at innovating or using, you know, the latest tech to make pretty pictures and design stuff. Mm -hmm. This was using technology to kind of really go deep into solving clients problems and they've got you know i mean I, they had a, a whole floor basically filled with their with different clients what kind of problems so it tends to be large infrastructure complex projects yeah well with this thing they're doing everything <laughs> they are actually doing it they started off with very difficult complex sites for very heavy process-driven clients, airports, infrastructure, oh, Glaxo, Klein, Smith, you know, pharmaceutical companies, data centers. Um, and they were able to bring, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of heavy amount of data analysis and data modeling to sites um, to be able to unlock the physical assets of their clients. So it could be, you know, solving you know, traffic control in an airport. It could be solving the way, you know, how do people, how do you make sure people... Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so, and what they've ended up doing with some of with their clients is that they've got this kind of, um, their clients will often come to them with a problem statement. So rather than the clients coming to them with a brief for a building, yeah. they come with a problem. That's amazing. Which is, and, you know, I was like, well, is this beyond the remit of an architect? And he was like, no, this is architecture. And I'm like, of course it is. That's what we're great at. Yeah, solving problems. We're, we're, we're great at problem solving. And, we're, and if, if we're able, you know, the solution is not always a building. It doesn't need to be a building. You know, uh, um, what's the guy who wrote, what's Sarah Wigglesworth's husband called? Jeremy Till. Jer Jeremy Till um, recounted a story of a young architecture practice. So there was a school that had a problem with... Um, student congestion in the corridors. Mm. Every time the classes ended, the students would all get scrammed, fights were happening, all sorts of stuff. And they had a whole load of different architects look at the problems and all the architects gave solutions of new buildings, widening the corridors, multi-million pounds inventions. And a, a, a very a small young practice, whoever it was, looked at the problem after the you know the headmaster was kind of like this is just going to cost us millions of pounds to redevelop this and the young practice took it away and came up with the idea of why don't we just redesign the timetable yeah. and put a new bell system yeah. in so that the classrooms don't you know and that's what architects do that's a perfect example like, yeah. you know and and uh, bride and wood are kind of doing that sort of thing on a larger scale with complex um uh, data-driven clients and it's really inspiring and they have this floor with which is just filled with their clients so people who work for BAA or that's a client smith are sitting next to each other and you know they're bringing problems to 
the architectural team or the software team and they're starting new discussions about it. And then they've got this incredible reservoir of data and information. So everything is, you know, coders and software um, have got this wonderful culture of sharing everything. Everything is open source. It's how you learn to code. This is amazing. And, and, <laughs> and they're, they've basically, all these, all these um, projects that they're doing designs for and modeling data for, they kind of create these reservoirs of information, which is totally accessible, it's open source, the code is all open source, they're creating these platforms for sharing information. The clients at first were concerned about, you know, what about patents and, you know, certain security issues and whatever. And they've enrolled the clients of being like, look, the more we share the information with other clients and other people, the faster the technology evolves and the faster the solutions get better, which is better for you and it's better for them. So it's like, wow, okay. And they've just built this resource, this huge, huge data Where? resource of, of information. It's, it's, it's online. Where are they it's, based? It's, it's, uh, Brian Wood, did you say? Brian Wood. They're based in Gray's Inn Road. Where is that? Holborn, near Holborn. Chancery Lane, Holborn area. Mate, that is... That is so amazing. I love moments like this in the podcast when I'm just like super inspired. It, it, it's mind blowing, yeah. Yeah, absolutely mind blowing stuff. And from the perspective of like, well, this is how you move into new sectors. When you're able to start presenting, you know, uh, solutions to particular problems that clients are having, you're going to become an attractive option to winning work and winning at winning a new client like it's not all about the, the the presentation in the portfolio where you get graded on pitches like this there's so much more depth to answering um you know client problems and you know building and using architecture to benefit humanity and society like it go it's it's, it's more than just the physical assets of you know the, of, of our cities it's amazing that is, that, that's really inspired me. I was always struggling to see, because that is my focus right now in terms yeah. of my studio, is the, the use of data, the use of the internet of things and how that applies to architecture. And uh, currently I'm exploring, you know, data, you know, data that responds to human behavior and how that can be used to, 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 to navigate around architecture and, you know, influence the architecture. And that was what I was saying before, that first my vision was how does architecture influence behavior but then i realized actually it's actually how does the behavior influence the architecture and that's when i was like yeah we inform the buildings it shouldn't be that the buildings inform us even though they do and they inevitably will but i think the starting point is how do we behave and then how does the environment suit that behavior mm. and i think that yeah, exactly architecture is often a response to something yeah and again it's this idea of conversation like it's an interaction it's, yeah. it goes back and forth that it it evolves you know we start communicating and interpreting and perceiving and using architecture in a certain way and the way we use it then informs how we're going to design and how we're going to build and how that building evolves and that building then in turn kind of you know physically and so you know in, in kind of traditional sense of it starts to inform how we are thinking about our own ideas and behavior. So it's this kind of circular conversational yeah. interaction between people and architecture that's non-static and is constantly dynamic. You know, it, it, it's, architecture has no kind of inherent meaning to it. Mm. It's what it is. It's right there. It's experiential. It's a, it's a live it's a live thing. We bring the meaning to it with our words, with our interactions. It can provoke and stir stuff up in, inside of us. But there is this, there is this generative relationship that we have, that we are constantly creating architecture by inhabiting it. Yes. It's not, and it's, and it is in, you know, informing that mode of creation. Yes. Well, I know I'm naming this episode because I love your thesis. It's the, this conversation and, you've made me realize that it really is it's you're always communicating and the more we can kind of work on how we communicate then that tool that we use called design and architecture and whatever you want to call it is perpetually improved mm. uh, because it is communication it's just communication through different modes different ways ryan why is mcdonald's such a good example for architectural entrepreneurs 
McDonald's. Yeah. Did I say that somewhere? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> In a video? Well, I think you were talking about uh, how McDonald's... Systems. Kind of, yes. I probably was talking about systems and the way that McDonald's is a... Well, for starters, McDonald's... Like, what business is McDonald's? Food. It's real estate. What? <laughs> it's a real estate company. Because it's a franchise. Well, because they, well, operators own the franchises. Yeah. So they have a kind of, so a franchise is a set of systems, right? A repeatable set of systems. Mm -hmm. People go to McDonald's not because the burgers are particularly good. They go to McDonald's because the food is consistently the same all over the world. Wow. You know what you're getting. That's true. So <laughs> there, there are systems. That business is so system driven. They have like one of the most intensive um you know, manuals for operation that it's so good that you can hire a 14 year old kid to operate your systems. Yeah. That's how good it is. That's what, ah. that's what makes the company valuable. That's so true. And so those systems are what are packaged up and sold to an operator. So someone who's going to buy the franchise and then the franchise then operates in a physical location on the land. So McDonald's, the company, McDonald's, owns the land of which the building is operating on and the franchise will end up paying some sort of rent to the, to the landowner, which is McDonald's. And McDonald's owns some of the most premier real estate in the entire planet in, you know, major intersections of cities. So it's like, it's actually a real, it's, it's kind of, you know, major mode of operation for revenue is like real estate. And it's, it's fascinating. And so for us, to, we've got to put, we've got to separate, right? I'm not a, um, I'm not going to condone everything that McDonald's does and the, yeah. how like the impact it's had on the kind of health of 21st century society and the kind of lack of care that comes with, you know, grotesquely scaling things that rapidly and the impact that it has on meat production, right? These are things that we've got to be able to, True. Uh, to separate in order to be able to see what we can learn from it in terms of a business. So the fact that it's, you know, it's kind of a, a food operations outlet, which is really a real, a real estate company. I mean, Ray, Ray, that's how Ray Kroc used to describe it as a real, real estate company. Um, and the process of highly refined systems that were able to produce a consistent product, you know, and the marketing is part of that. You know, you know what you're going to get when you go to McDonald's. People make a decision to go to McDonald's because they know that the chips are going to be like what the chips are. And they would rather do that than take the risk of spending a little bit more money on a burger and chips they never tried before. Yeah. They don't know where it's from. It's just the, yeah, it's it's the, the brain. Safe place to go. Yeah, it's the brain. You're like, fuck it, I'll just do yeah. that. I'm going to go, I'm <laughs> going to go, I'm going to go over here. So as architects, what we can learn from McDonald's is the idea of systems and being able to um, not necessarily produce the same product over and over and over again, but the standards of quality that we can systematize in our own businesses to ensure that we're delivering great projects every single time. Yeah. And so that, again, that's a lot of the work I do with architectural practices yeah. is to kind of interrogate the systems or lack of systems that they have in delivering architecture. So from marketing systems to um, sales systems to, you know, and these are conversational systems to the delivery systems that are involved, CAD systems. I mean, architects are pretty good with their, well, generally quite good with the more technical CAD systems that might be involved in the practice, but the more business systems or financial systems um, that can be used are often missing and actually taking a, an approach to developing that as a manual or as a set of uh, videos, instructions, all sorts, there's all sorts of ways that you can, you can do it, um, builds company culture. It means that, you know, your staff and employees can be involved in the building of your business. It makes work easier. It makes, it makes the, the, the role of the job, you know, more fun. Yeah. Um, Things become more predictable. You can start to automate certain tasks that don't need involvement, yes. which frees you up to do um, more enjoyable design tasks. I mean, the process of sketching and drawing, you will have a system in place for like, you know, how you might want to do it. You might give yourself a certain amount of time and the best architects have a system or you could use the word ritual. Mm. 
for doing things. That's another, that's another way of sort of translating what that is as a system. But companies like McDonald's are interesting to look at and to study in terms of how they have developed very clear, programmatic, systematic ways of delivering a hamburger and chips um, in a consistent fashion across the world. That's incredible. We have a lot to learn from McDonald's as architects, but I like how you kind of separate the fact that, you know, we're talking strictly about one aspect of McDonald's that we can learn from. Yeah, and, and, and McDonald's is a, is a great one to, to look at as well because it, it also, you know, the culture of architecture, we're often, and again, this is a kind of university culture where we, we're led to believe that the drawings speak for themselves and the buildings speak for themselves. And I don't know, I don't know if that's true. I, I, I question that. But we, well, we end up getting into a culture that the best work wins the project. The best work, you know, the best work gets the highest grade. Therefore, the best work is the one that wins the competition brief or wins the client or et cetera. And it's, that's not the way it works. McDonald's does not produce the best hamburgers yeah. in the world, but they're the best marketers of hamburgers. Yeah. They're the best salespeople of hamburgers. Who's the best salespeople of architecture? I don't know. Foster's? Foster's is, is like quite legendary in the way that they, uh, the way that he communicates and the way the arc angles is, 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 is pretty uh, amazing in terms of how he aligns what he, you know, his, uh, his vision with the business case of whoever the client is. It was interesting, I was reading a uh, you know, uh, quote from B.R. Kengels where he was saying that often architects criticize him or no, they say, you know, you're a good communicator of your work. Uh, and he was saying that inside of that statement is often the implication of like, you're, you're a good communicator of your work, but you can't deliver good architecture. And you might hear that with architects where they might say, oh, he's a good marketer, which is a mm. kind of, it's a dick. It's a diss, it's yeah. It's a diss, basically. Yeah. You, know, you're, yeah, you know how to chat bullshit, or yeah. you know how to chat the, <laughs> chat the chat, and your architecture is rubbish. So that's a kind of, you know, we need to like get out of that because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help. And it also, you know, you, you've got to be able to market yourself. You've got to better communicate. And good marketing is not brochures and portfolios and a wrapping good marketing informs the service like with joe cowan the, the total service and the offer was transformed because of her her ability to understand the position and the pain points of her clients at bride and wood same thing you know you, you might not call that marketing but that deep level of problem statement and problem solving with the client and that deep level of collaboration is marketing informing a service apple again those products, the iPhone is coming out of good marketing, right? You know, and, and when, you're, when you're that good at marketing, like Apple, for example, or you've got that kind of entrepreneurial genius like Steve Jobs, where he's able to be so deeply in the listening of the marketplace that he is able to anticipate what the next trend will be. Now, that is when you're at that real sweet spot of innovation and you know, you can kind of start to predict a little bit. Good musicians do this. You know, good musicians are able to reinvent themselves. Yeah. They, they, they listen. You know, I've, I've heard um, David Bowie and other musicians talk about, you know, they imagine how the audience is going to be listening to the song. Mm -hmm. But they also know that the audience wants to be surprised by something they haven't heard. Yeah. So this is where the art and the marketing kind of get kind of mixed in together and... It can be very, very creative. You know what you just made me think of? If you see a Jackson Pollock painting, as someone who's never, who doesn't know Jack about art or Jackson Pollock, mm. they'd look at them and ask, that's someone spilled some shit on a canvas. In some ways, it made me think that there's a very clever piece of marketing going on there. Because I kind of agree with you in that I don't believe that a piece of a visual piece of art or your architectural drawing speaks for itself just based on its visual merit. Then there seems to be something more behind that. And I think of some of the outstanding students I've seen in my uni and I've walked past their crit boards and, you know, they've got a crowd around them. Um, and, you know, they're, you know, 
everyone knows that this person's work's amazing. And yeah, the work is amazing. <laughs> but I almost feel like there's another aspect to it and maybe they've marketed themselves in a particular way. Maybe the, 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 the way in which, this is a bit of a stretch, but maybe the way in which they behave, the way they interact with their tutor, the way they interact with their peers, you know, the way they communicate their ideas in that crit, suddenly people will look at that work and be like, oh, this, this is special. And it, then it takes a, you know, a spilt piece of paint or a, you know, extremely, you know, basic looking painting that you would then go, no, this is a masterpiece. Because the Mondrians and the Kandinsky's, you know, I mean, Kandinsky is pretty t technically difficult, but some of those non paintings don't, they aren't hard to do. And I've just come from Rotterdam seeing the most basic, you know, shapes comprise a, you know, a, an architectural building that people are drooling over. Mm. They marketed that. The Stahl movement, they really marketed that this is new radical architecture that is reconciling scientific thinking with affordable construction and people's psychology. It, it's really starting to make this connection in my head now that marketing the word carries a lot of stigma. Yes, because we often think of marketing as just purely being the superficial wrapping that surrounds a product, yeah. right? And there's plenty of evidence to demonstrate you know good marketing selling shit products yeah but that's not you know that's not going to last and the same thing in, in, and it's the same thing in architecture school like you can't blag your way if your work's shit yeah. or like i mean i have seen students <laughs> deliver <laughs> incredible stories yeah. uh about their work and yet there's no there's not much work to be seen but the story is so enrolling that you're just like oh my god you know, and then, you know, if they're a talented student and the drawings back up and are in alignment with the quality of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, there can be a misalignment where there's a quality story and there isn't a quality drawing or the, inf the, the visual information isn't there to, you know, to, to quantify it. And that can be picked up, picked apart. And there's the whole discipline of architecture and drawing language. And, you know, so drawings, I mean, again, a drawing does speak. I mean, I'm going to kind of contradict myself. A drawing does speak for itself, but depends who's looking at it. Yeah. You know, and again, it goes back to that conversational thing that we're, sure. we're kind of creating the story around mm. something. Like I can go into, I'm sure you're the same, you go into an art gallery or you go into um, to look at something amazing. Uh, I was in Antwerp recently, actually, and again, looking, look, looking at the, you know, the Rubens house and some of the, the portraits and the paintings or going to the mass gallery and seeing all the contemporary art, there are certain things that visually get me excited and get me like, whoa, this is mind blowing. And I don't need to read or hear anything about it to understand. However, I have brought that conversation to it through yeah. years of education and studying and immersing myself in what it is to, you know, cultivate your way of looking at something. So I'm bringing the words to it in itself. So, it can speak for itself, but again, it depends on who's the one, who it's speaking to. And um, that's why you've got to make it a fluid thing, right? Something yes. you're always adapting and making bespoke for people. Right? Yes, exactly. And so the language and the way that you, you might present a project to, at school, and I mean, I've seen it at the Bartlett where there's been people who have, who have presented atrociously yeah. incredible pro projects. Yeah. And then people who have presented terrible projects incredibly well you know and the tutors will be able to distinguish the distinguish the two and if there's if there's some something real in the in the words and the language mm -hmm. then you know so that there has to be a marriage between the product and the marketing and that the marketing is not i think the point i want to make is the marketing is not um mm -hmm. yeah well yeah and it's not and it's not surface mm -hmm. like it kind of goes it goes deep from inside mm -hmm. and informs the 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 nature of your offer, mm. of your service, of your product. It has to be genuine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't just be, I mean, Wolf of Wall Street's almost a good example of that. Like, I, you know, it's almost as if like, if you're gonna sell me this pen, you could blag about it. But if you really believe, I've used this pen for like 10 years. I love the smoothness of this ball, you know, to really, tell the truth about your product because you believe in the quality. Well, what's the, what's at the end of that film? What's the, how does he sell the pen? I forgot. 
he asked the question, um, can you write your name? He said, can you write your name for me? Yeah. So he creates the need. Right. That's how he's, that's how, the, so that's, again, that's a profound sort of lesson in sales yeah. where he's ta he creates the need right. for the product. Right. Um, and that's what marketing does. I mean, you look at the marketing of perfumes and smells and stuff like that. It's just like, I, I find myself, you know, I was in the, in the airport recently and I was looking at all the, you know, Johnny Depp, savage pictures and yeah, yeah, yeah. like getting kind of like, oh man, if I had this yeah. in my room and then I could squirt it on myself and then I was <laughs> like, yeah, then I'm going to get, she's going to like me and that's going to be, oh yeah. Cool. And I was like, what are you doing, Ryan? <laughs> like we, you've, you've been like hypnotized into the, the, the whole, you know, I'm suddenly fantasizing about being Johnny Depp. Yeah. Right. And you're like that the whole industry is based on that kind of aspirational yeah. image of something which has nothing to do with the actual reality of the products necessarily right it, it's kind of like a um you know it's it's a it's a it's a random liquid with us with a smell inside of it but the the two have kind of got this so really you associate with johnny depp because you see it you know he's an ambassador yeah. for it. but you but arguably that's quite a negative thing then to kind of create these false connections that people have these uh, kind of perceptions that they're going to be something or they're going to attain something that isn't really well, it, it, well it's clever because it doesn't it doesn't directly say that so mm. it, it's, it's like if the if the if the slogan was become johnny depp by squirting this on yourself no one's going to buy it no one's going to buy it but it leaves enough space for you to invent the story of yourself okay so you know marketing does does this marketing is this is deep this is deep stuff yeah <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm 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 interviewing Rory Sutherland in a few weeks, who's the vice president of Ogilvy, of Ogilvy, so a big advertising company, right. and he's written a book called Alchemy, which is really really worth reading and very deep into the human psychology of how can people make decisions, what influences behaviour. What's it called, sir? Alchemy. And and basically, why non logical things sell, you know, like why why on earth why on earth do you use a meerkat to sell insurance? <laughs> There's no logical sense to yeah, it. Yeah, it's so true. But it works. Why? It's people. It, He's that, got a kind of foreign charm to him. There, there's yeah, yeah. There's 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 not necessarily like a logical reason for oh, it, but there's crazy. a psychological reason for it. Oh, I'd love to. I want to tune into that. Yeah, it, it's really, really. Is that the book's kind of about that? Yeah, the book, the whole book is about that. Wow. Well, they, he was he was describing a story that they did with TFL, and TFL were discussing about how to improve their customer experience, mm -hmm. and they wanted to improve the customer experience through the marketing and advertising of of. And again, this is where marketing influences a product or a service. So you craft your service in order to fulfill on the needs of what your client yeah. wants, right? You're not just wrapping something in something else. Yeah. Um, TFL had a, had a need to improve customer service and passenger experience. TFL were doing huge amounts of research into widening tube carriages, um, expanding the tube, dealing with the physical assets of the company. Very expensive stuff. Ogilvy went in, did their sort of cognitive behavioral research, you know, lots of you know, real, real time data sampling from people. So Rory Sutherland has developed a cognitive behavioral science unit within Ogilvy, which uses huge amounts of raw data of, of people's behavior, which, which then gets used into their, into their marketing. They found that one of the biggest frustrations, and again, it sounds so obvious when you hear it, that one of the biggest um, frustrations that passengers were having was waiting on the track and not knowing when the next train was coming so i don't know if you've ever experienced that yeah. you, like you just there isn't there either, there either isn't it isn't coming up mm. on the board or there just isn't a a little sign saying anything yeah. and, and that would be put you in deep anxiety <laughs> yeah it's just like ah and they that was the thing they implemented very simple just to make sure that there was always a um you know wherever there wasn't a timetable visible to put one in 
that was a very kind of low cost, if you like, but m low cost, but huge benefit in terms of service and perception of product. So happier tube customers means a big, makes a big, big difference to the overall perception of the entire service. It was fulfilling a need. People, human beings don't like not knowing. You can put, you know, if you don't know how long the train, it's worse not knowing how long the train's going to be and the train is going to come in two minutes, if you don't know that, than waiting for a train that's going to come in 10 minutes, but you do know it because this is there's some sort of certainty in it. So this is, this is like... It's like simplicity. It's very, it's very simple sometimes to solve quite a complex problem in, 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 in some ways. Yes, yeah. And, and, and again, it's like it's human beings. People are infinitely interesting, unpredictable. Human beings have their own psychologic, you know, we post-rationalize things, that triune brain theory that I was talking about earlier. You, you make your decisions based on something emotive or based on some sort of instinct. And then we post-rationalize why it is that we're doing it afterwards. And, you know, often the more intelligent we are, the more uh, seemingly logical and rational the explanation is for it. Yeah. So it, it's, it, again, this idea of understanding your own cognitive mechanisms and how you're creating your perception of the world and the own, your own internal conversations is very key to your experience of life and your ability to be able to market and understanding what kind of service and offer to create for someone to that's going to sell what i'm kind of learning is it's almost the first thing you should ask yourself is what is needed or what does what does the uh, the, the customer or the client need and then from there you can adapt your business or your proposal because arguably you could do it the other way right where you have your kind of specialty already and you try to fit that into a certain that's market. what everyone does that's yeah. why most businesses fail so you think that's you're saying that's the wrong thing to do well m most businesses fail because there's no market need for it wow so most businesses fail because somebody often spend somebody has a hunch and an idea of something and they think this next this you know everybody wants to have um you know let's a coffee cup holder that goes onto your your waistband or whatever, for example, right? Yeah. And they spend years and years developing like, dragons these, 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 yeah, yeah. these kind of amazing, like counterbalanced mechanisms and like, it's really slick and, you know, and, you know, they spend hundreds of thousands of pounds developing it. The technology is great. They're going to take it to market, but nobody wants it. It's not, it's not, it's not a need. It's not, there is no market for it. So this is where marketing, you understand, you start solving somebody's, problem you start solving the need this is why great business ideas often come from solving your own problems because if you're struggling yes. with if you're struggling with something that's irritating or a pain um you know it's likely that other people are going to be dealing with that as well and something like you know something random like that you need to you need to figure out whether that's a genuine market need or or not you must love dragons then I do love Dragon's I've, Day. I think I've watched Shark Tank, Dragon's Day. I love that. Yeah, I them. think I've watched every minute of Dragon's And they've just started re redoing their videos now. It's a, and another amazing marketing strategy they've done, actually. They're just reposting their old videos with a new you know, uh, logo. But what you're describing is exactly what you see on Dragon's yeah. Den. And it's a great resource to, to, to yeah, learn it, from. Well, right? Exactly, because you start to see that there are lots of ill-conceived ideas. Where they have the vision first and then try to fit it into a market. Exactly. Rather than starting off with the vision and kind of allowing the market to inform what it is that's wanted. And this is what I was saying about Steve Jobs. Like you couldn't go to the marketplace and them tell you we want an iPhone. Right. right? He understood that there were other problems that people wanted, like, for example, being able to have a device that operated as a phone, an MP3 player, a computer. Um, a camera that was the kind of like recognizing that there was a problem there that people didn't want to have all these different devices or and also understanding that people don't want ugly looking bits of tech yes. they want something that's got that, that's got status and that's sexy and that's slick and the, like that like that can never be underestimated like people don't buy things for the practical reason they buy things because it makes you appear better you know, it's status that's involved in it. People get their houses designed are, you know, 
every single client I've ever spoken to, when you ask them, why do you want this house? They will, they will say, we want more light and space. Yeah. No, they don't. <laughs> There's all sorts of different stuff going on. Right. I'll give you an example. I, I was um, pitching for a project and I was up against a like, much more experienced architect who had like, you know, beautiful portfolio of work and all sorts of stuff. And in the sales conversations that I was having with the, with the, with the lady about her house, um, I, I kept asking her questions like, you know, why do you want to have this? And she was like, you know, the house is a bit dark and grim at the moment. We want to get more light and space and, you know, we want to have it for the, for the family. Mm. And then, I was then I asked, what's the worst thing that could go wrong with this project? What's your biggest fear about hiring an architect and doing this doing this project? And she said, Oh, not getting planning permission. And at that point, I could have just said, Oh, okay, well, I'm, you know, we work with you to get planning permission. That's not a problem. Yeah. And, but I asked her, why? Why? Why would not getting planning be a bad thing? And she was like, Well, if we don't get planning, then I wouldn't be able to get the house, you know, we'd have to make compromises and I wouldn't be able to have the house exactly the way I want it. And I was like, okay, why is it important for you to have the house exactly the way you want it? She's being a psychologist now. Yeah, and she, and she was like, she was like, well, it's really, I really want to have the home, you know, signify me and I want me, I want to come in and like the house just, it says me and it's got me written over it and like I know that it's mine. And I was like, okay. Do you mind me asking why is it important for you to have your home signify you? Why is that a real driver for you? And she said, well, at the moment, it's very much my husband's ex-wife's house. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> that's why. You, that's why." So you from planning permission to there's almost like there's anxiety of jealousness in a way. Yeah, exactly. But that that was done in a tactful way. And done in a way that built on rapport and trust and, you know, built a relationship between me and me and her. And so that's just an example of, you know, again, when I work with, with architects about like, you know, there's a, there is a, a process in, in conversation where, you know, and it goes back to those, you know, that, that experience I had on the, mm-hmm. as, as the charity advocate, asking questions about what people are, you know, why, where are you coming from? And this idea of psychologic, you know, it's not necessarily a logical thing to, you know, to I mean, build a new house, but like that's the emotional thing that's driving human beings. And every human being is the same. We have these kind of like, you know, these deep rooted psychological things that are driving our entire lives. I mean, what a wonderful example to show how, you know, the deepest aspects of one's of a person's internal world, the psychology, the behavior, uh, the the real kind of yeah, the psychology of someone. Uh, it, once you can unlock that, or you can access that, obviously in a in, in a professional and consensual way, mm. uh, you're able to really use your architectural skills to create something positive, mm. and. That's what I've been really passionate about with this two worlds design thing as well, which is, you know, trying to reconcile the psychology with the architecture, but really kind of acknowledging that there are two worlds this operates in and you have to bring a balance between that. And I love that example you gave of how you you kind of peeled off the layers Mm. and suddenly you unlocked her architectural psychology of what she wants to do with the space and how that was based on something deeply emotional for her. Yes. Yeah. And you then were then in a position to give her the best quality outcome. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and, and all and all clients, people have got their own personal agendas. And right. our role as the architect is to inquire about that. Yeah. And to uncover them and right. you know, be be respectful of them and to be non judgmental about them and to have our clients, you know, share with us what it is that they're wanting to create why they wanting to create it like for a developer we've been with the developers only they're going to have strict financial measures but there's a reason why people want to make money and it's never because you want to have money it's because whatever money facilitates for you so being able to uncover that about why it's important for an individual and again it becomes more complex when you say you're dealing with multi-headed clients because you're dealing with lots of different individuals who've got lots of different personal reasons for their jobs you've got you've got collective 
reasons and emotional needs that need to be understood and met. Um, and you need to be able to kind of sift between all of them and communicate with all of them and learn to enjoy the mystery that is human beings and how wonderful it is that people are kind of unpredictable and yet there are predictable behaviors that that we all go through and there are all these kind of you know there's just different ways of connecting with 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 our clients and the people that we work with and the teams mm -hmm. and this is why the best marketing is leadership wow. yeah. that's that's really i mean if i have any message at all that the leadership of yourself so this is the kind of self-awareness. This is the kind of understanding your cognitive mechanisms, being able to have discipline with things, understanding what, what psychologic is driving your life, mm -hmm. uncovering all these kinds of crazy decisions you've made about reality that aren't actually real, but have come out of, you know, things that have happened in childhood or just the complexity of how human identity is built up. Um, and you're just being able to, in, it, understand that and lead yourself to do things that you want to do and accomplish and then that kind of expresses itself in how you lead other people how you lead conversations and your marketing and your sales is an expression of that leadership yeah business itself you making me realize is is a, a incredibly kind of humanistic process a psychological process where you need to understand you need to really mm. understand your client and your and your customer in order to help them, and I think that correct me if I'm wrong. That's that's the crux we've kind of we've uncovered the crux of what is the kind of philosophy of business and business of architecture yes. maybe as well, yeah. and it's a deeply kind of psychological uh, or almost a therapeutic one. I feel yeah, it's that that whatever that quote was that great person on Twitter wrote about. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly, the, the yeah. sales is this mixture the of three, the three were uh, kind of worlds of uh, performance, psychology, and something else. I'm sure I, I probably am, I'm paraphrasing somebody else's quote there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where you see, yeah, you said um, marketing sells art forms, but it's the where the performance meets the psychology meets design. Yes. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's. Yeah, this is this is great, man. I'm I'm glad that we we're able to get this deep into it because what I like to do in these episodes is really get to the crux yeah. of what you know these specialists that I speak to, including yourself, what what you're about and how that can be used to further the potential of architecture. Yeah. But this this is the reason I was so excited about this episode is because the business of architecture is so heavily ingrained and applicable to everyone. Yes. That to really understand how because we're kind of going to come on to the last thing i want to talk about which is the unpaid internships mm. and kind of to understand because again chris holdry did a kind of postgraduate paper on this where he found all the evidences of why and a lot of it was kind of showing that there is a there's a problem in our field of of almost the financial struggle which has resulted in this you know unfortunate thing of unpaid internships and you know, I kind of wonder what, why are we in this position where we're, we're doing the most, you know, time consuming degree, expensive degree because of the, how much we need to, you know, how long we need to do it. And then coming out with, in proportion to the time we spend studying it, some of the lowest salaries possible. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, that kind of answers why maybe some practices are having to do unpaid internships, but this, we're in this kind of, you know, really negative cycle of one thing kind of generates the other. I mean, as a person who's been talking about business for such a long time in architecture, mm. why are we in, in this crisis uh, uh, of unpaid internships? Fear. Like, to, to kind of put it very simply, there's the fear of rejection and... That's why we don't market and sell, sell ourselves. And that is some one of the obstacles that gets in the way of like good business hygiene. Um, the fear of doing the fear of doing something differently. Um, I mean, I don't know the reasons for unpaid internships in every single office, yes, right? Yes. And I'd have to speak to every single office and understand why that is happening. And also are you know the individuals who are participating in it are they d 
doing it against their will or they're doing it. Yeah, I mean, course. most people are doing it because they want something. You know, students who are in a position to be able to take an unpaid internship are willingly, you know, I've had friends who have gone and worked at, um, you know, great practices uh, for free um, because they wanted that name on their CV. Exactly. And then it's gotten them an opportunity to uh, get into another prestigious university course or, you know, we, we have, a, I mean, there's loads and loads of things wrapped up in, wrapped up in why unpaid internships exist. One, one is, you know, um, on one hand, it could be, and again, it's an individual by individual case, like, you know, in Japan, for example, it's a cultural thing. Yes. It's a cultural thing. Yes. Like it's, it's very usual for people to go and work kind of insane hours and, you know, a lot of the younger generation in Japan is kind of revolting against this. Architecture is not the only industry where that's um, using it. I'm not, con I'm not condoning this either, but I, I, I am seeking to try and understand what the context is for it. And it will be different in different scenarios. You know, a lack of business hygiene could be another reason. What would um, that mean, technically? Like, you're not, you're not making enough money. Yes. You're not making enough sales. That's why I said. Why do you think businesses struggle with that? I mean, uh, that's a really complicated answer. Uh, that works. Fear, right? Fear. I mean, just put, put fear to diversify. Fear to take a risk. To, I mean, selling and marketing is scary. Right. There's a there's a if I'm if I'm talking on a real basic human thing, right? When you see a beautiful woman in the street. You're not gay, are you? Are you gay? No, no. No, okay. <laughs> I just need to check. Because, um, you know, it, it, whatever sexuality you are, right? Yeah. If you see somebody who you're attracted to, you right? Put forward a book, you, business put forward. Yeah, it is, it, if you see a beautiful woman, yeah. right? Is your, do you naturally just go up and start talking to them? Generally, no. No. Yeah. What happens? Uh, fear and, fear of rejection. Yes. Fear of rejection mainly with maybe a mix of, uh, yeah, have I really got it in me to do something like that? All of it comes up, yeah. right? All of it comes up in that instant. Um, you see somebody, she's cute. You're like, and it's it, like the, there's no logic to it. Yeah. There's, there's no threat. There's no, she's not going to kill you. Um, you know, unless you do something really stupid or you say something really sleazy or yeah. just like inappropriate. Like it, it's a, it's logically a very low risk mm -hmm. thing. But to actually go and start a conversation, for some people, there may be like a fear of, of doing it. Sales and marketing is the same because, you know, you will be going and either interrupting somebody, you're putting yourself out there publicly. Um, there's an apprehension about what people are going to think about me. What's the pretty girl going to think about me if I just totally mess up what I'm saying? What's the... You know what? What are other architects going to think about me if I start marketing myself like this and selling myself? Or I'm not good enough yet. I need to make sure I've got a better portfolio in order to do this kind of work. There's, there's all of this stuff, basically, which is some form of fear. And the more intelligent we are, the more um, uh, what's the word? The more kind of Unidentifiable, unidentifiable the fear is. So the fear manifests itself as a conversation in your own mind, but it's going to look like very logical reasons. Yeah. Oh, you know what? We're, we're not going to just approach, we're not going to go to that networking event today because there's nobody there who's good anyway. And, you know, we're doing very sophisticated architecture. I don't think it's appropriate for us. Architect, people should be coming to us because blah, 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 blah. You justify your, your, your own anxiety as something else. Yeah, exactly. The, the fear is the, that part of the brain the reptilian brain which is preventing you from taking an action and then the human brain comes in makes up a very logical well-reasoned response as to why you don't do it then you get into troubles of your business mm -hmm. sounds and marketing na naturally mean taking a risk and they take the risk of rejection because you can try and put you know you're ultimately saying do you want something and somebody's going to say no mm -hmm. and what we do as human beings the same in the crit what happens in the crit is that we forget that it's not it's not us, but it's our work, yeah. and we collapse the two. So we think that we're the ones that are being rejected, wow, yeah. but it's not us who's being rejected. It's the work, or in sales, it's the proposition that's being rejected that the client's saying no to. So it's a very base human thing 
and it drives so much of our behavior and it means that people get stuck into a rut of doing something the same way which then creates an unhealthy business environment which then over long periods of time becomes justified and reasonable and there's all sorts of reasons about why it is like this and the industry is a mess and you know and 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 this is happening and da 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 da, da. and you know and a business is suffering and then it will end up engaging in kind of unethical practices yes. which mean uh, other people are then exploited too. The other side of that, though, is that I, I, you know I would say that the, that there's cultures like in Japan where it's kind of quite common for people to go and and do unpaid internships. It's quite common in lots of other industries. Yeah. I had a friend who, for example, uh, you know was a musician, and you know I mean if you're a musician you don't get paid for anything anyway. As an entrepreneur, like. You don't paid for half the thing you for 99 percent of the things you do you don't get paid for you know you you but again it's not for everybody i wouldn't i wouldn't encourage it and if you've got a team you want to be paying them and looking after them and making sure that they're enrolled in whatever it is you're doing if you can't pay them then you need to be able to offer them something of equal value yes now some students view that's a great point some view some students will view um and are in position circumstantially to work for free and they can do that and they see the value of being able to have that practice's name on their cv which will then lead to other work and other jobs that's very well put you know because some of the other people i've asked this question to have said the same thing i mean obviously adam not being one of them because you know as you know adam was kind of behind the kind of uh, the uh the the outrage that began of uh, junior shigami kind of being uh, one of those people who did unpaid intentions. But I spoke to Arthur Mamumani after that. I spoke to Chris Hildry as well, and even Angela Brady. And uh, obviously there's a people, some people are more leaning to one side of this and some people are leaning to other. But I think you and myself as well and, and, and others have the kind of, I mean, you, you've got to be able to understand the context of these things as well. And... Uh, that's why I liked what Chris done as well, and that he wrote a postgraduate kind of paper on this. Yes. That there's so many factors, and I think you've quite eloquently kind of deconstructed that right now in, in what, in a way, systems that don't work can result in. And it is this kind of, if you can fix your system, your business system, through, this, through some of the things you've been describing in terms of communication, which is the fundamental of it, you won't end up in a place where you have to do these unethical practices. So I think that's a great way that to kind of uh, kind of end it because it's summarized quite poetically now, I feel. Yeah, and I, and I think that sort of business hygiene and the business discipline and the learning the art of communicating, you know, in order to grow a, a healthy company, that, that ultimately is the foundation of us being able to fulfill on all the missions that we want to do in life or can be. You know, we want to make a difference um, to the environment, we want to make a difference to the people that we love and we care about, we want to make a difference to whatever causes are important right. to us. Being able to have financial resource and capital makes doing that a lot easier. And we live in a society which is unequal and unfair, and not everyone starts off in the same position, and there are all sorts of institutional um, blockages and constraints. And there is the possibility of being able to create something new and for you to be able to like carve out your own life and do something. And again, I, you know, I, I acknowledge the circumstances are different from people, but I, I really have met so many, I mean, you know, Yvonne, my, my partner, like, you know, what she's created and I was speaking to David Pearl, who's, uh, you know, like, you know, got a net worth of 250 million pounds owns vast swathes of of um columbia road and things like that listening to him speak about his story from coming from very adverse conditions and being able to create something and again it's our responsibility to be able to help everybody else be fulfilled and be able to lift themselves and do whatever it is they want to be able to do to finally finish off and as brief as you want um what advice would you give young professionals or students in design and architecture 
those people who will, who kind of have the entrepreneurial drive and are looking to do something quite creative with their design but when they look at the the the, the kind of the landscape of where we are now they're incredibly fearful of what is ahead in terms of the opportunities in terms of am i really going to be able to do something creative or innovative what would you say to them um it's mindset and psychology and to look at the conversations that you're having with yourself that's really the kind of crux of being the author of your own life is how are you creating reality for yourself and if there are things that appear like constraints where are the constraints is the constraint in the reaction you're having to a circumstance or is it actually a genuine constraint that's immov immovable? And in that psychological like evaluation or analysis, like we can change paradigms that we're operating in and we can change perspectives and we can start moving towards something which is we're looking for the opportunities in that's been presented to us. And this is a kind of like, you know, a bit of a sort of, spiritual thing in a way or you know like the message of lots of spiritual things for example is like how are we we've got the opportunity like whatever life is throwing at us like we've got the opportunity to define what the meaning of it is and how are we going to choose a meaning that's empowering for us or one that's constraining for us and it's not always simple and it's not always straightforward but there is this immense ability of human beings to be able to create your reality and create your experience of life. So being 100% responsible for your experience of life and choosing to interpret something powerfully and if life's getting you down and it doesn't feel like there's any possibility and there's no hope, like the first place to look is like, what am I making this mean? You know, choose to be responsible for your internal domain. Once that responsibility is there, then you can stand in a different room.